Welcome back. So we're talking about hypothesis testing and we're doing some examples. We're just working through some examples of how you set up a hypothesis and test it based on data. And I have a really nice example um, of a two-sided rejection region test that I learned you know, 20 years ago when I was taking Dr. John Quintanilla's class at University of North Texas in Denton. And so I'm just gonna walk you through this really cool example of a two-sided rejection region uh, hypothesis test. We've done a lot of examples of a one-sided region, rejection region. Let's do a two-sided region. Okay, I'm going to read the problem statement and then we're going to solve it. It's a pretty simple um, version. It's a simple hypothesis. The problem statement goes as follows. Last season in the NBA, the average points per game were um, an average value of 94.81 points per game with a standard deviation of 7.16 points. Okay, this is just data from the last season. To increase scoring and improve kind of, you know, viewer, uh, viewer numbers, the NBA enacted new rules to try to increase scoring. But critics of these rules said that it would actually have the opposite effect and decrease scoring. So in this case, we think that there's a modification, there's new rules, and they might increase or decrease the average, the mean scoring. So in this case, um, we need a two-sided rejection region because there's a chance that we have increased or decreased the mean uh, significantly, okay? So that's gonna be a two-sided test. And so the data from last season uh, is here. And then this season, in the first 432 games, uh, the average points per game is 94.69, okay? Um, so you look at these and they actually look really, really close. 94.81, 94.69, too hard to tell if these are the same distribution, different distribution, same mean, different mean. We're going to use a two-sided uh, hypothesis test to get some idea of whether or not it's statistically significant that something has actually changed. Good. Okay, so um, pretty simple. Let's write down the null hypothesis. So generally, we always write down the null hypothesis. H null is that the new mean, I'm just going to call it, um, do I want to call it mu2 or do I want to call it, um, let's say, mu um, tilde. That's the mean from this season. Okay, the, the new mean is equal to the old mean, uh, which is 94.81. And the alternative hypothesis is that the new mean has changed. It's not equal to the old mean. It might be higher or lower. Okay, the average scoring uh, may be higher or lower, but it's not equal to the old mean. It's higher or lower. Okay, so that's it. Um, and, and notice that this is not, this is in fact not, the alternative hypothesis is not that mu tilde is greater than 94.81. That would be the null hypothesis if you're not trying to also, um, if you're not listening to the critics. The critics say that it might decrease the scoring. If everybody thinks it's going to increase the scoring, you might only test that mu is greater the 94.81, but because some people think it's going to decrease and they have a plausible explanation for why it would decrease, we're actually testing this blue hypothesis uh, up here. Okay, good. So the null hypothesis is that the mean didn't change. That's usually the null hypothesis is that nothing changed, that there was no effect of your modification. So now we build our test statistic. This is pretty simple. Uh, maybe I will do this in green. So our test statistic is going to be Z and that equals our sample mean, this guy uh, x bar is our sample mean. 432 is n, that's the size of our sample. Uh, 7.16 is sigma, the standard deviation of the underlying null hypothesis distribution, and this is mu. And so our test statistic, we usually take our sample mean minus our putative, our nominal average that we're trying to re refute, that's the null hypothesis, divided by the standard deviation over root n. That's called the standard error, is sigma over root n. Because if n is really, really large, um, it kind of squashes the variance of x bar. And so we should have more confidence with a bigger n. This should be like, this should, we divide by 
by, uh, by root n. This is our sample statistic. Again, this should be approximately normally distributed because x bar, we assume each of these games is independent iid, that's a bad assumption, but like, let's just assume it's true. Then this x bar would be a Gaussian normally distributed variable with a center around some mean value and some spread. Okay, so we know from the central limit theorem that this is a normally distributed variable. So if I subtract the mean and divide by the standard error, this is a unit normal um, variable. Z is from nominally a unit standard normal distribution. And I can plug in the values now. So this is equal uh, to 94.69. Uh, let's actually do this. 94.69 minus 94.81 is minus... 0.12 divided by sigma is 7.16 times root 432. And you can plug these into your calculator. This is going to give you a number that is approximately minus 0.36 standard errors. We always say standard errors because that kind of tells us how far away a, a standard deviation in this unit normal would be plus or minus one. And 0.36 standard errors is actually really in the bulk of the distribution. It's really squarely in the middle of this distribution. So I'm actually going to draw, you know, 0.36 is somewhere like right here, very much squarely in the middle of this distribution of the kind of this is where the null hypothesis lives um, in the middle here is in the null hypothesis. Um, and these are our rejection region. For a two-sided test, if I want a p-value of 0.05, if I want a 95% confidence uh, in my alternative hypothesis, for a two-sided test, the rejection region are actually smaller. Each of them is only 2.5% um, um, of the distribution. So I'm trying to find the kind of standard errors where I get 2.5% on either side. Those add up to 5% and that's the rejection region. So I would have to have a, a, a Z value of bigger than or less than uh, 1.96. So greater than 1.96 or less than negative 1.96 to reject the null hypothesis. I'm not even close. I'm solidly in the middle of this distribution. I fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we fail to reject. Uh, and so essentially what that means is that we really can't say, we, we don't think that this modification increased or decreased the scoring. We think it had no effect at all. These rules didn't change scoring. Um, that's an example of how you would do a two-sided rejection region test. Um, your rejection region gets a little smaller because there's two rejection regions. So for 5%, um, you need each of them to have 2.5%, which pushes them a little farther, a little more, you know, 1.96 standard errors instead of 1.645 for a one-sided test. And this number here, this Z value of 0.36, of negative 0.36, shoot, technically it's actually over here, it's negative. 0.36, not positive 0.36, but again, it's solidly in the middle of the distribution predicted by the null hypothesis. So this is actually, you know, looks like this is generated from the original distribution. Nothing changed. Okay, um, that's just an example um, of a two-sided test. There's other examples. I think I told you about the cigarette company example where maybe you're trying to test and see if cigarettes are um, healthy. So there's this, this, this cigarette case um, where maybe you're trying to test, you know, if uh, you have negative effects because of, because of cigarettes. You know, people think that they have negative effects on your lungs. And so you might have decided to create a one-sided test that you're trying to test, you know, are cigarettes harmful? Did you get a negative effect in, uh, in your population, in your, in your, you know, smoking group? that would be a very reasonable thing to, to do. And that would set up a, a confidence interval and a rejection region. You'd have to be negative 1.645 standard errors, you know, to, um, to assert that that's true, that cigarettes are bad for your health. But very clever thing you could do if you are big tobacco is you could argue, you could, you could cast doubt in the following way. You could say, well, cigarettes may indeed harm the population that smokes, 
maybe cigarettes have unknown positive health benefits. Maybe they actually clean your lungs and have magical properties. And so in the case that cigarettes could not only hurt your population health, but also might improve it, that becomes a two-sided rejection region test. And that becomes a more stringent test. You need a, you need a more rare uh, Z value. You need more standard errors. You need to be farther from the mean of the distribution to reject that null hypothesis um, that, that cigarettes do nothing. And so here you need to be at 1.96 and minus 1.96, whereas here you need to be at minus 1.645. And so if you have 30 people in your control group and, and smoking group, this change here might be enough to, um, to cause the null hypothesis to hold up that cigarettes don't do anything at all, even if over here you would reject the null hypothesis and say that cigarettes actually harm you. Very clever thing that you can do with statistics. And again, I'm telling you this so that you don't get into trouble doing this yourself and so that you know what to watch out for. Um, think about what people's motivations are and how they're formulating uh, their statistics. There's another cool example from Rice's textbook on ESP, extrasensory perception, where you could do a test. This is actually something you can do with your friends. Um, you know, get a deck of cards and, you know, randomly draw a card. Don't show your friend, but let them guess what the suit is. Then, you know, reshuffle, draw another one, have them guess the suit, reshuffle, draw another one, guess the suit. You can do this 50 times, 100 times, whatever. And based on the probability that they would do this at random, you can compute how many times they got the suit correct, and you can use that to test the hypothesis of whether or not your friend does or does not have uh, kind of psychic abilities. So that might be a fun homework problem or way of testing this yourself. And I'm going to claim that that's a two-sided test because they might be more lucky than average or less lucky than average. Okay. Um, good. Two-sided tests are important. It's important to know the difference and when to apply them. And again, it always boils down to this test statistic, at least when we're comparing means of distributions um, and how many standard errors away you are. Okay. Thank you.